started. Thanks, Heather. Um, for those who I haven't met yet, my name is Alex Gradwell. I'm with the Maritime Washington National Heritage Area. Um, I recently started helping Heather out with these calls. Um, so really excited that all of you could join us for this month's best practice call. Um, this month we have a guest joining us. Um, Matt Turner is a social media specialist with the National Park Service, where he has the very large job of managing the agency's national social media challenge, uh, channels with millions of followers. Um, so today we've asked Matt to kind of just talk through some general best practices for posting on social and how we can better leverage different platforms. Um, he'll also cover some ways that we can grow and engage our audiences through storytelling, um, infusing some personality into channels, and providing calls to action. Uh, the plan is to have Matt give a short presentation, um, and then we'll have time for Q&A, and we can kind of discuss, you know, how, how his tips and tricks uh, might best apply to national heritage areas. So with no further ado, uh, Matt, I'll turn things over to you. If you have trouble with screen share, just let me know, and otherwise you can take it away. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the invite, and uh, I hope the technology works. We usually use Teams, so Zoom's always an adventure too. But, <laughs> but I do have a, issues between the two, I'm sure. I, <laughs> I do have a few slides I can share, uh, and then um, I'll go through some of those topics you mentioned, and then certainly open it up for questions uh, for anybody who has them. But again, uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, like Alex was saying, I do work uh, in the National Park Service Communications Office, so based in Washington, D.C., and I manage uh, kind of our flagship National Park Service kind of channels across the various platforms and help, you know, push out messaging and any campaigns, policy guidance to all of our uh, people in the field who are doing social media at the park and program level. And uh, that also includes, you know, working with national heritage areas and, you know, sharing out uh, your stories as well. So I'm going to attempt to, to share my screen here. Uh, so I have 50 slides to go through. Just kidding, it's like 10. So. <laughs> but uh, just a few kind of basics to get started when it comes to kind of the social media and how we use it, which I think uh, would be helpful. Again, a lot of things around social media, just think about, you know, he's using social media and it is a, a lot of people. Uh, in fact, uh, today around, you know, seven in 10 Americans are using social media. Certainly uh, younger adults are among kind of the earliest uh, adopters and continue to use all the various platforms at different levels. Uh, but yeah, usage among all groups uh, continues to increase. Um, one thing to keep in mind is, uh, you know, social media users are typically on their phones, on their mobile devices. So uh, that means they can really be reached anywhere. And uh, for me, or for many users, you know, social media is part of their daily routine. So it's for us in the National Park Service, especially, it means we can share news, we can share events, really uh, real time information and get a lot of success and really kind of engaging people, you know, right there on the spot. So again, um, what are some ways to then kind of leverage your social media? I mean, for us in the Park Service, especially, we want to use all of our social channels to really kind of create that engagement. You know, we're looking to share all these different stories, certainly highlight uh, the overall mission, um, all these kind of work and projects being done across the service. We want to highlight uh, the diversity of parks and programs and areas out there and kind of uh, elevate the awesome. We really want to showcase, again, kind of those positive things that we're doing uh, in all these parks and programs and really kind of you know, show off again, all these, you know, unique places that make up uh, the entire National Park Service system. Uh, big thing to keep in mind though, social media, it's all about being uh, social. You know, you gotta be present and ready to engage with your followers uh, to really help grow that online presence and that awareness about uh, your sites. And again, you know, most users, uh, including the media, the reporters out there too, uh, they access social media on, on their devices as well. So that gives them, you know, a channel to quickly contact you in real time. And that allows you to again respond quickly, kind of continue that conversation and, you know, leaving a positive impression and getting your, your stories out there. Uh, just keep in mind too, you know, social, it really needs to be part of any of your major kind of comms plans that you have. Again, uh, it's often the first source of news outlets and journalists seeking info about, you know, your area, uh, an event, uh, any activities you're having. So what are some of the platforms to kind of uh, keep in mind uh, and what's best for your message? 
I think the biggest thing is just to think about uh, your capacity. You know, do you have kind of the, the power and the time to invest uh, in the different platforms? You know, we encourage even our own parks that you don't have to do everything. You know, maybe you just want to focus more on Facebook or Instagram and, you know, you don't want to focus on Twitter or any of these other ones. So, you know, again, think about uh, your ability to kind of manage and monitor these accounts. I think most uh, probably all of you have a Facebook account, which I think is a good catch all. It's by far still the, the biggest used platform. Uh, but, others, you know, Twitter is a great place uh, to, again, show off those, you know, events and activities. Uh, often used really by reporters and media to really kind of uh, pick up those stories and run with it. If you have some great images, you know, having a Flickr account is a great way to kind of upload those, those photos and, you know, organize them by albums and they're easy to kind of share out with the public. Uh, Instagram as well, still a great uh, platform to show those high quality visuals, maybe have some video or some reels. Uh, if you are using a whole handful of platforms, maybe a management tool is for you. In the park service, we do use Hootsuite. Uh, that's open to all of our users to upload their accounts and allows them to draft and schedule. And again, helps kind of organize uh, their content in just an, an easier way. But again, you know, think about your capacity of your staffing. You know, maybe you just want to focus on putting great quality content on your Facebook page and not being stretched thin trying to produce content for four or five others. So. But I think in a lot of good uh, platforms to kind of focus on. Uh, so you've kind of picked a platform. So things to keep in mind uh, to ask yourself when you are kind of creating a post uh, to put out there. Right off the bat, you know, what are your communication goals? You know, what do you hope to kind of uh, obtain by posting this kind of information out uh, in the online world? Think about who the intended audience is and what do you want them to do with it? You know, does it include questions or a call to action? Do you want them to kind of share their experiences? Uh, is it media friendly? Again, is this uh, a post that has a, an attractive visual, uh, can be picked up by, by journalists or reporters and the news, and again, uh, shared even more widely? Uh, again, photos, graphics, video, think about that. Uh, what can support your post? Uh, they always say that posts that you know use visuals greatly outperform those that just use uh, the text option. So um, I know for the parks, we're always encouraging them to, you know, showcase, you know, high quality images, um, you know, videos, graphics, uh, a great way to again, create that engaging and uh, really shareable content. Um, accessibility is a big thing as well. And I'll have a kind of later slide just to mention about it, but definitely make sure everything you're putting out there is accessible. So, you know, use those platform tools, uh, make sure they're five bullet compliant, the alt text, any videos you put out definitely uh, need to have the captions as well. But posting also comes with uh, pitfalls. So before you post anything, always think about, you know, what type of questions or responses you're gonna get. And again, this comes down to capacity too. Are you prepared to, to monitor and manage any comments that come in? respond to any questions, correct any misinformation, or just provide you know, additional resources. Um, as social media managers too, we always have to be aware of the world around us. So you know, what topics or conversations are trending. So it's very important to kind of stay alert and keep in mind what is happening around the, in the world around us. And again, as mentioned, you know, just is staff available to monitor your post. Uh, it's easy just to hit that submit button and then kind of look away, but it's very important to kind of uh, keep a watch on how a post is performing and again, be able to be present really to respond to any comments and provide additional information as needed. Uh, think of your social media too. Are there opportunities for collaboration what? or tagging? I'm uh, on a so definitely, you know, uh, um, as a national heritage area, a lot of those do overlap with parks and other programs and a lot of them have uh, social media accounts. So I think there's lots of opportunities to reach out and to work with those sites and those accounts to again, leverage uh, both sites followers. Uh, what are some ingredients for a good post? These are some just high points to, to keep in mind. Again, an engaging visual is always key. Um, having something that really provides value, kind of a, uh, something that's timely and accurate as well. And some of that prompts uh, a response or, or reaction. And then also it connects uh, to more of the story. So you have your links and your hashtags. So you can kind of see uh, from the visual there, 
Um, again, we always try to have kind of an engaging visual. Uh, the middle paragraph there, again, kind of that provides that value, that opportunity. What are we trying to share with the public? Uh, as a timely, you know, we're making sure to put all of our information and our dates. And then we do, again, provide a link to the rest of the story. Uh, you know, for the Park Service, a big goal of using social media, it really is pulling a lot of our resources from mps.gov, pulling all those great resources and stories, sharing that tidbit on social, and then really driving that traffic back to our website to get the rest of the story. So uh, we try to keep that cycle going of, of pulling and sharing, because again, um, social media is a great tool to engage with the public and share out these great resources, um, but we don't own any of the sites. Uh, our home base is always gonna be our website. So we always wanna try to drive that traffic back to get kind of the, the rest of the story and those more resources on our website. Uh, just some other content considerations too. You definitely wanna make sure your voice aligns with your mission and what you're trying to achieve. Um, I already mentioned kind of part of using social media is being aware of the world around us and where that message fits in. And definitely keep in mind, you know, context can change. Uh, definitely trust your gut, uh, ask for other opinions when you're kind of creating content. Uh, everything we post on social, we're always looking at it from 100 different angles. You know, does this quote make sense? How is this context? Uh, is this use of humor appropriate? So definitely having other eyes, and other people kind of look at things before you hit that submit button is, is definitely key. And again, especially for us, you know, we're always striving to post quality, meaningful content. Uh, you know, people trust the National Park Service, especially to be putting out that factual, accessible, and that current information. And um, a key thing too is just always double check your grammar and spelling. Autocorrect uh, is not always your friend. And if you do misspell, the public will, will definitely call you out on it, so. Uh, but again, some, some more best practices too. Uh, if you are using those engaging visuals, this is something we always remind our parks as well to do. Uh, just make sure you're always showing, you know, images of visitors and staff that show responsible behavior. Uh, an example here, we do show a lot of, uh, you know, images with pets, uh, the dogs here. That's a great, you know, compelling visual, uh, but we wanna make sure that that dog would have a leash on it, or, you know, we're showing people staying on the trails or not climbing things. So uh, definitely we wanna make sure that we're again, kind of illustrating those best practices that we want the, the public to follow. Um, again, too, you know, the National Park Service, our main account, we do use a, a lot of humor. We try to humanize and, you know, pull back that curtain just a bit. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, it's fun and funny when appropriate, but we still want to be professional. Um, when we're posting something that is meant to be humorous, we're definitely kind of sensitive about, you know, how it's going to be interpreted, uh, you know, whether it's going to be widely understood. Uh, so again, when in doubt, you know, ask a colleague, get another opinion. Humor is definitely uh, subjective. Uh, uh, another thing to be uh, aware of is, again, just those current events, uh, those trends before posting. Uh, very important, too, if you really schedule out a lot of posts. You know, the world changes really quickly around us, and you want to make sure that you're putting out content or, or content that's launching at a certain time is appropriate in case something has changed uh, around us. Uh, monitor engaging is also a big part of how you can continue to kind of, uh, you know, grow your followers and engage. Again, you really just can't hit submit and kind of walk away. You really got to be present and monitor your comments, uh, um, especially if you intend to post something that is going to kind of elicit a, a lot of feedback. And definitely, you know, interact uh, with users when it's appropriate. We always try to, you know, banter back and forth uh, with followers. We want to provide more information or correct any misinformation. We link to like additional resources on our website. Um, and definitely, you know, just uh, you can kind of tell which people are asking questions, which ones are making statements. Um, remember, you're not always obligated to respond to every comment as well. And we certainly encourage our folks to, you know, definitely engage with the positive comments, really kind of help, help elevate them above kind of any negative ones. And uh, as a good social media manager, you can never, uh, you know, take any comments uh, personally. Um, and just finally, too, uh, again, just accessibility. Uh, that's a, a big thing that we try to push on all of our, our platforms. The platforms themselves have come a long way in the last couple of years by providing areas to put in your alt text, uh, to provide, you know, your video captions, to upload that kind of information as well. So, 
definitely everything you do want to put on social, just make sure you are providing, you know, that alt text description, you know, those captions, uh, using those descriptive links so that if someone's using a screen reader, uh, you know, that uh, post will, you know, really benefit them in a, in a more meaningful way and definitely making things really accessible uh, for everyone. So that was a really quick uh, kind of run through a lot of topics right there, but I thought the rest of the time we could just kind of open it up to, to questions and and see uh, what y'all are doing with social. Okay. But just takes off, uh, you talked a bit about, you know, like when you've tried that and it hasn't worked out. Sorry, you were cutting out. Can you repeat? Oh, sorry. Is that okay? Is it better now? Yes. Okay. Um, I was saying that you talked a bit about, uh, you know, finding a voice that is both fun and professional. And I was just asking if you have any examples of when you've tried that and maybe it hasn't worked or it's kind of fallen flat? That's never happened. No. <laughs> never, not once. <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, I think, uh, again, humor definitely is subjective. And I think as a government agency, especially, people don't really expect us to do that kind of, uh, you know, humanizing or throwing out so some jokes here or there. Um, for the most part, we do have a positive response because we try to always incorporate a deeper meaning attached to any of our, our, our posts. We might use a joke or, you know, repackage kind of a meme or a saying more as an attention getter. And then we get people to read the rest of the post, but we're infusing that with, you know, tips how to hike smart or here's some really important bear safety tips, uh, things like that. So we always try to, you know, package it in a way where there is some some meaningful you know not just posting just to post just to get a laugh or to get a share but definitely making sure that we're always staying on brand and and providing that informational portion of what we want our social media to be is you know we want to educate we want to entertain so edutainment is kind of the key that we go for um, we also throw out safety with a smile so you know we want people not to pet the fluffy cows or the bison. So if we can encourage them by having a fun graphic, but also including, you know, 10 tips on ways to watch wildlife safety, that does create that shareable moment. And it also gets those tips to go along with the ride, hopefully. And so more people will remember that. And hopefully when they get to the park and they roll down their window, they'll pull their hand back in and not pet that bison. So, but uh, bison summer petting season is coming up. So we'll see. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, again, you know, some things or some people don't always get the reference or uh, the pop culture nod or, or you know, the joke. Um, but that's a great way just to see who your audience and how they respond and they definitely learn for, for future posts going forward. Great, thank you. It looks like we have a few in the chat, so I'll just, I'll just read those out. Um, the first is how does user generated content work into your strategy, if at all? Um, we don't do a lot necessarily from the public. You know, everybody wants to uh, send us their pictures and their videos and, and things like that. Uh, and there are some great uh, things out there, but it's one of those if we accept one, we have to accept them all. And uh, we also worry about tagging personal accounts and, and driving traffic to people that we have no control over. But I think. Uh, when it comes to partners and other government agencies and other things like that, there's lots of opportunities to collaborate and, and work on content together, uh, you know, keeping it on that level. But um, actually user content and, you know, crowdsourcing is the big thing right now with social media because it is that kind of content that everybody can create. So as a government agency, we have to kind of walk that fine line again about how we work with the public, but other, you know, partners and agencies may have a little more leeway in you know, crowdsourcing, um, requesting people to submit their materials and things like that. Uh, in fact, last year for the Park Service birthday, we really, for the first time, made a call of action to the public to send us their videos and their 
uh, material of them being in parks that we could then compile into a video to share out. Uh, the hardest part for us was just getting some kind of a platform pe for people to share us their stuff because it's not easy with the government, uh, non-government kind of computer systems. But uh, um, you also get a whole lot of videos that you probably could never use either. But uh, it was a good experiment for us to, to get that kind of user-generated material and see uh, you know, what we can do going forward. Uh, just a quick show of hands of people on the on this call. Feel free to use the reaction. Does anyone here do user use user generated content at all in your strategy, whether that's like video or photo or tags? Seeing seeing a couple thumbs up. Cool. Um, okay, next question. Uh, does your level of engagement increase on posts with humor versus more serious posts? Yeah, they really do. Um, I think uh, people, you know, we've certainly found, I think studies have been done too, that people really use social media certainly to be informed, but also to be entertained as a place to kind of escape. So I think for us, the, the posts that we do kind of infuse that nod to pop culture or uh, a pun or a dad joke or something kind of witty in there. Those are the ones that really do have the greater traction. And so that's why we do try to infuse those important kind of tips or other information in those, because those do have the, the opportunity to travel a lot further and get that message out. Uh, um, sometimes it can be disappointing because you do have some really great, you know, posts to put out and compared to maybe using a funny joke, they might not do as well, but it's that kind of finding that fine balance. And um, certainly for the park service, we still battle that idea of, you know, people get upset when we don't share a mountain or a tree and we have to focus on, you know, a historical site or a cultural site. You know, we want to show all these great other diverse parks and programs. And we're not just about, you know, Yellowstone and Grand Canyon. We love those parks, but uh, there's definitely 400 plus out there and hundreds of programs and areas. So uh, lots of great uh, areas to shine the light on. How would, um, I, our National Heritage area, and I know a lot of others cover like a very large geographic area with similar to what you're saying, like a lot of different stories and natural resources and cultural resources. How, how do you find that balance between what you're featuring and, and do you have like a calendar or like a checklist? Like how do you make sure to spread that attention evenly? Yeah, especially on the national account, we definitely want to curate and kind of elevate all these different stories. You know, individual parks and programs have a social media account. So we're always looking through their material to see what you know we can elevate to those larger eyeballs on the main account. And from that, we do try to make sure that we're choosing from that diverse pool of historic sites and cultural sites, natural sites, um, whether it's a national register site or a natural area site, uh, you know, we really want to showcase all the different kind of aspects of the park service and all the different, again, programs and jobs and grants and policies and, and you know, science and history work that we do. Um, so it's not always easy because, uh, you know, definitely people come to us and we got to throw out those pretty pictures and those sunrises and those, you know, amazing, you know, Yellowstone, you know, wildlife, because those are a hook and those do grab those eyeballs and come in. So it's kind of finding that balance of, of trying to rotate uh, between, you know, those national parks, the, the parks with the national park in their name and, you know, those historical sites, historical parks. And um, I've worked in the park service for, for a long time. And I mainly worked at historical sites. So I do have that kind of historical site uh, chip on your shoulder when people are like, it's just about Yellowstone, but no, it's, it's about all these other great, you know, historical places and we want to, to get those. And I think that's the benefit of using that bit of humor though and getting those viral posts that go out because once we get people starting to follow us, that's when we can kind of throw out again, these other places, these other stories that they weren't expecting and now they can, you know, learn even more. But yeah, we do have, uh, we do always try to focus on the national kind of, uh, monthly campaigns that exist out there for everybody, you know, Women's History Month, Black History Month, Native American Heritage Month. We're always looking for ways that we can, you know, you know, latch onto those kind of messaging via our parks and programs. And, you know, a, a great source on the web too, is just to look up those, you know, This Day on History, 
uh, look for, you know, the national days, the national anniversaries and holidays, some of the sillier ones and the more, you know, serious ones, but there's also great ways to kind of connect. And for us, we're lucky we do have 424 parks and hundreds of programs to then see how that fits in with this day or this anniversary or this, you know, day in history. So, but yeah, always look for those connections. Yeah, you guys definitely have, have a lot to work with for better or for worse. Um, on a related note, what metrics do you find most insightful to track and measure the effectiveness of your of your efforts of your posts? Yeah, on a basic level, we really just use the platforms themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly likes and the reach are some numbers that you can you know at least pull from and, and share up with your your supervisor to show you know what people are. are really, you know, reacting to shares, especially, again, we want to really create that shareable content. So we're seeing what other people are pulling from and sharing and how they're and where they're sharing it uh, to see how to get those numbers up. Um, we do use Hootsuite as our management tool, like I mentioned, and that does provide a whole tool set of kind of analytics that we can create reports. And that helps us track, again, uh, some numbers and they have a lot of new tools too, where we can like even track uh, sentiment, uh, how people are reacting to certain news stories, we can track hashtags. Um, so we've done that for, you know, national campaigns, uh, Fat Bear Week, that's always a big deal. Um, and other, you know, uh, you know, national campaigns, National Park Week. So that helps us to again kind of track how our posts and how kind of our engagement has, has been doing and how it's being picked up by uh, the outside world. But yeah, the platforms themselves, I think they do still provide a lot of good Kind of basic numbers that can at least give you an idea of how your how your posts are doing. I will say I love Fat Bear Week, so <laughs> that is one of my favorites. Bigger and bigger every year, no pun intended. So. <laughs> it's truly, truly shocking how large some of those bears are. Um, okay, next question. Um, Grace asked, in terms of frequency, how often would you suggest posting to keep the audience engaged? Weekly, daily? Yeah, I think it really kind of depends on your audience, on your on your numbers. Um, certainly for our, our national account, we sometimes post up to two or three times a day on Facebook, at least once on Instagram. Twitter's kind of a free for all. We'll, we'll post some threads and and see how it you know uh, trickles down. I think uh, you definitely want consistency in your posting. So definitely. Once a day is great, once every other day is great. I think again, depending on kind of your site and your the, the size of your audience, um, that would kind of determine your frequency. But I think definitely anything that you do kind of schedule out, just be consistent. Uh, for a long time, we were posting maybe three times a day on Facebook, you know, once in the morning, once midday, maybe once in the evening, you know, kind of think about how you may use social media. You know, you're on your phone when you wake up, maybe in your lunch break and then at the end of the day or before you go to bed. So those are the times we try to like catch people. And uh, again, those analytics too will kind of show you when most of your people are online or, or checking out your content. And sometimes it's pretty static, but it, it fluctuates occasionally and you can kind of get a better idea of when you might want to post something. But, uh, but yeah, don't, I don't, we always tell our own, own people, you know, don't feel overwhelmed. Like you have to post all the time or connect to every anniversary or every kind of campaign, but definitely do what you know works best for your capacity and, and for the message you want to get out. That's good to know. I, I'm, I'm sure all of us wish that we had a couple, one or two people to do social media full time, but I don't think, I don't, with a few couple of exceptions, I don't think most of us do. So good to know that capacity can really guide that. We have a couple questions about accessibility. Um, so Daphne uh, from Delaware and Lehigh asked if you could talk a little bit more about how to make posts accessible, particularly on Facebook, um, or if you can share any online resources about doing that. Um, and then we also had a question kind of related to that about how do you incorporate the audio descriptions into your posts? Yeah, again, accessibility is something we really want to strive to have on social media. And for a long time, we were kind of at the mercy of the platforms themselves. Um, but again, they have come a long way with providing the areas to you know, put in your alt text, uh, to upload your, your video captions, even for live streaming, they do you know, live captioning now, especially for your events. So um, I can share some resources after our call too. And uh, 
I kind of walk you through some of those. Uh, definitely take the time to, you know, put in your alt text. Uh, that is actually generated by Facebook itself. But again, it's usually always 100% wrong, or it's just going to pick up a basic, like, random word. So it's always good to go back in there and adjust that. Um, if you, you're scheduling it out, you can usually provide the alt text when you're scheduling it out uh, if Facebook's not being glitchy. Um, but I think it's definitely important. We also include like an image description in most of our posts. So just something at the bottom of a post to again provide a little more context to maybe the image we're sharing, um, especially for us where we're pulling from all these different parks and programs that actually gives us a chance to provide again, kind of a caption, tag the park where it's you know focused on and even you know include the photo credit if we have that uh, available. So we try to just cover all of our, our ends and, and making sure that we, we provide that. Uh, it's not always gonna be 100% perfect. I think there's still a long way to go when it comes to like the platforms and everything being perfectly you know, accessible, but uh, it's definitely something that you should strive to do for, for all of your posts. Uh, Great. Um, you had talked a bit about, uh, a couple times during your presentation, you talked about the importance of using really engaging visuals. What would you, like, how would you describe an engage, engaging vehicle? Is there like a formula or is it just kind of you go with your gut? Um, a lot of it's you go with your gut, uh, but you definitely want just in, an engaging visual, if that includes people, um, high quality photos, you know, it's something we struggle with in our a lot of our you know postings, especially when we're doing um, sharing out with grants and, and policies and guidance, and we just don't have a lot of pictures sometimes when it comes to maybe heritage areas or you know historic homes or or things like that. So anytime you can go out and take the pictures, that's great to have. Uh, but definitely you know just having you know that kind of grouping of photos that you can have on hand to kind of kind of share out. And um, sometimes we've been stuck with some fuzzier images or just some, some dated images. So I think just always kind of having uh, some high quality, fresh images on hand is always good. Uh, you know, we use a lot of people with people to show people interacting with a wayside exhibit or recreating on a trail, just so you want to give people the idea that that could be them in a picture. Uh, in a lot of ways and showing some kind of action. So that's always key, but again, making sure they're on the trail and they're doing things responsibly and you know, not petting the bison. But, um, but yeah, I think uh, images is always something where this is the hardest part I think about social is always picking that great image to go with something. And um, again, we are fortunate in some ways though, where we have some great wildlife pictures, we have some great landscapes and things like that. We pull a lot from the MP gallery, which again, that's the the public facing gallery that has a lot of great images, public domain uh, that park rangers upload. And I can provide that link. Uh, there's, I think there's a lot of heritage area stuff already on there. Um, and if you all have great images too, you can always send them our way and we can upload them to that because um, then anybody can have you know easy access to that and, and download. Um, well, related to that, we have a question from Arabia Mountain. Um, how do you manage problematic posts that get tagged to you? For example, people petting bison. Yeah, we get tagged all kinds of things though. So it's almost, for us, it's hard to like keep up sometimes because anybody uh, will pull us in. But yeah, we get tagged in, in people whenever there's graffiti or drone usage. Um, a lot of the times it's not even on national park land, but uh, it's something that if we can identify it, we'll definitely try to, you know, pass on to the agency or, or keep a watch on things. Uh, um, but yeah, if we do see a whole lot of things coming to us, maybe that's an opportunity for us to, you know, create a post or try to address something either subtly or, or more direct. So I think, uh, you know, we're always looking to see what's ever out there and um, we don't usually reply directly in case we do have, you know, all the information to go in with that. Uh, like we know exactly where they're coming from or where that footage was taking place or um, that kind of stuff. So, um, but it's definitely something to keep a watch on. And if you do, if it does blow up in something where hundreds of people are tagging this one, one person, then that's something where, you know, we would, you know, 
get someone else's attention on that. Like if someone's hitting golf balls in the Grand Canyon or, or again, you know, doing some graffiti on a park service area, then that's something that we could then show, you know, park police or, or let the park itself be aware of that situation so they can then investigate. But yeah, a lot of observing. <laughs> I, I, I'm guessing that you actually have been tagged on someone hitting golf balls into the Grand Canyon. Oh, yeah, there's been a couple of cases with that, so uh, um, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Olga, we had a, a follow-up that I missed about um, the accessibility question. Um, if an image description does describe the graphic, what's the purpose of using alt text as well? Um, it can be kind of tricky. You know, you hear both sides of it. Uh, I think it's always important to use those tools that are provided by the platforms. They're there, they're built in. And we know that, say, a screen reader will, you know, pick that up and make sure that, you know, that image is going to be kind of accessible and available to that person. Uh, the image description, I think, is just an extra. I think uh, it depends on how you want to kind of use it. Again, we use it more almost as a caption at the bottom of a post to, to kind of include just a little more descriptive text, but also, again, providing where it came from and again, kind of the credit. So some people only rely on the alt text. Some people really just want the image description. So it kind of, if you look at all the different kind of sources out there, you kind of get both sides to it. So we kind of just uh, do a little bit of, uh, of both. Right. Anyone else have any questions? Um, folks, please feel free to uh, unmute and or raise your hand or just chime in. I will say on the national account too, we're always looking to elevate, you know, stories and uh, different parks and programs. So you know, you feel free to always, you know, send me an email or reach out to me if you do have some stories and if it's something that we can maybe share on our channels or if you want to tag us and that kind of stuff, you know, we're always looking for that kind of collaboration, especially um, we want to showcase, you know, the, the heritage areas because uh, they're a big part of the service and I think uh, a lot of untold stories that can still be uh, shared out. Yeah, that was actually going to be my next question to you is how can national heritage areas engage so it sounds like email emailing you and, and tagging yeah definitely you can tag our, our, our main account or you know tag a park account or a program mm -hmm. account that you may be near um and I'm, I'm sure they'd be happy to kind of engage um, and collaborate you can always message uh, our office uh, in communications you can uh, contact me directly and uh, you know we'll look for ways to you know work together we can share out you know some content as well um you know we have like national park week coming up at the end of april we have nine theme days um each with like a broad theme that really anybody can connect to so you're welcome to kind of i can share that page with you as well and you know look for ways that uh, a national heritage area can, can connect to one of those themes and you know we usually host like a twitter chat and if you're on twitter you can definitely join into that conversation so uh, yeah, we're always looking for participation. That sounds great. Um, Matt, you do have some requests in the chat for your email. If it's okay with you, I can put it in. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, we got a question from Grace about, um, do you tailor your content for different platforms? Um, or for example, would you release the same photo or caption on every site? Yeah, I think uh, it's kind of up again to your capacity uh, and to, you know, the post itself. Uh, we often utilize a similar post across say, Facebook and Instagram. We might tweak things a bit here or there just to maybe shorten things up, say, on Instagram or, you know, we might carve out a little bit just to post on Twitter and create maybe a thread out of it. So uh, I think never hesitate to reuse and kind of recycle images across the different platforms. Uh, you may need to just tailor them a little bit differently depending on that audience. Um, you know, maybe Instagram skewed a little bit younger than maybe Facebook. We find some of our jokes work better on Instagram than they do Facebook. So, um, but again, you'll kind of kind of know your audience and know what they respond to. But, but yeah, there's lots of great images out there. Um, the, some of the platforms too, you know, a, a single tweet, you can add up to four posts or four images. 
uh, Instagram, you can do 10. Uh, um, you can create your stories using these images as well. So there's lots of opportunities to share that content across those different platforms. And you're going to be reaching different people every time. So it's always new to someone. <laughs> A little repetition is OK. Mm -hmm. Uh, this might not be something that you deal with a lot, but for those of us who are maybe just starting out on social media, we have, I, I think, six, seven new heritage area, national heritage areas, um, some of whom are on this call. Um, for those who are really just starting to build their audience, do you have any tips about paid advertisements on Instagram and Facebook? Not a whole lot. We don't deal with that as a federal agency. Fair. We have to be really walk that fine line. It is something we, we've thought about a bit though when it comes to like boosting posts and doing kind of that whole ad side of things. Um, and I think uh, for Heritage Area too, if you have a partner or a friends group or different communities, they could definitely you know step up and help in that kind of regard. And that's something that we would use. We would have maybe our partners or the Park Foundation kind of handle that side for us if we went that route. But I think uh, if you have the ability to do that, uh, you know, it could be a, a good way to, you know, at least get some more awareness out there. We've always just relied on the organic and certainly we do have the benefit of having the, the National Park Service brand. Um, but, uh, you know, we've, I think with uh, using the, if you do quality posts, I think people will come. Um, if you're putting out, you know, good information, people will eventually come to your, come to your site. And I think the biggest thing too, is remember just to be patient, like, uh, Sometimes you'll, you'll work so hard on a post and you'll put it out and you'll see like it didn't get as many likes or as many shares, but you know, you're still making connections and you're, and you're building an audience and you never know when something's going to hit, something's going to go viral, something's going to be shared. You're going to have that great story you're going to share out and then you're going to have that influx of people coming to see you. But uh, it can be a struggle these days. You know, the algorithms, I don't like math, but uh, they're always working against us. Uh, they're very secretive. We don't know how they work really, but um so it's always kind of a, a struggle, especially when you're not a large brand or a business or, or really paying for that kind of stuff. So, um, but uh, just be patient and keep moving forward. Uh, we've got another question in the chat. Um, do hashtags and other tags make a noticeable difference in the breadth of engagement for a post? Kind of yes and no. Uh, I think hashtags are definitely still a viable, Thing to use on Instagram and Twitter because people are, I think, actively searching those. And it's a great way to again kind of see what's kind of a trending out there. Not as much they say on Facebook as you know anymore. We still use hashtags almost as a way again to track our own type of content going out. You know, during National Park Week, we want everybody to use that. We want people to kind of you know latch on to um, the different other you know monthly campaigns. That way, when we go in to search for that content, we can just type that hashtag in and, and see all those different parking programs post come up. So um, use sparingly, I think, uh, you know, Instagram too, you can have up to like 30. You don't need probably all 30. So um, it's also very important to, to maybe research the hashtags too, if you're just trying to type something out and make sure that it's not trending in one way or it's changed or you've spelled it right too, uh, just to make sure you're not sending people off to some other search thing or something that's too huge. You know, sometimes it's easy to do hashtag nature and that's gonna have, you know, a million other tags, you're just lost in the whole thing anyway. So maybe think about making it a little more unique, you know, like a hashtag nature trail or something, you know, nature Wisconsin or, and you'll see that number goes a lot down how many times it's been used, but, Anybody who's searching then for that is probably going to see your content uh, than just scrolling through millions of nature tag things. What about tagging other agencies or partners? Do you guys do that often? Do you find that it helps increase engagement? Yeah, if you can. We stick again mainly to partners or other federal agencies. Um, and we do a lot, a lot with like Fish and Wildlife. We've done collaborations with you know TSA. Um, we've also worked with some outside partners too, like National Geographic. We've worked with NASA. And, you know, anytime there's collaboration going on between agencies, I think that definitely helps with engagement. Uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, national heritage areas can tag one another. You know, it's a great way to just kind of build up that community of, of doing those collaborative posts. If you have similar stories or, you know, you want to kind of build some kind of campaign around that. 
Um, but yeah, we don't tag a lot of outside media or, or news sites or any kind of private uh, uh, influencers or celebrities, that kind of thing. We really just kind of, for us, have to stick to the uh, other federal agencies, but uh, definitely tagging other parks, other programs, it was a good way. Although I have noticed a rise of national park influencers lately, but good to know that it's not um, you guys working with them directly. Yeah, for us, anytime we do that, we would work through the National Park Foundation just because they can work on our behalf with dealing all the brands and the, um, the influencers. And so I think people are disappointed when they come to us and they want to work with us and want to play with us and tag with us. And we're like, well, you know, here's the Park Foundation. We can't really, you know, advertise this candy bar for you, but maybe this uh, <laughs> other organization can, so. Uh, so this is actually related from that uh, to that. Uh, this is from Carrie at Crossroads of the American Revolution. Um, do you guys have a policy document that guides how you post with different platforms or how you engage with different, you know, kinds of people that come to you with ideas? Um, yeah, and it's something that we're continuing to evolve as well. We have a whole partnerships kind of uh, office. Um, still small office with a lot of stuff on their plate, but because you can imagine everybody wants to kind of work with the National Park Service or do some kind of branding. So we're still developing guidance, but we have some that I can, I think I can share. A lot of it's on the internal kind of uh, um, folders that we use, but I think there's some accessible ones that I can share out. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, Google wanted to work with us last year doing a March Madness type of things with night sky photos for their Google Pixel 4. And we spent, I think, a year working on it. I think they don't even use that phone anymore, but <laughs> before we even got to a point of maybe doing something with them, but there's just a lot to, to think about when it comes to partnering with outside agencies, especially companies and brands, because we can't be seen as favoring a company over another, that kind of stuff. And so there's always that kind of fine line of a government fund. So. A fun line to walk. Yep. <laughs> um, we have another another question here. Um, do y'all see different engagement in photos versus videos? And which would you recommend putting more effort into? Video is really growing quite a bit. Um, however, when we share videos on Facebook, I would say they really flop. <laughs> so the engagement is just really not there. And we try all kinds. We have longer videos, we have short videos. So I think it just really kind of depends on the content or when you're posting, if you're hitting it just right. Um, we do hope to do more on YouTube going forward. We have a channel. We want to do more with like YouTube shorts. You know, we've uh, done a few Instagram reels and those tend to do pretty well. So if you do those short videos on Instagram, um, those do pretty well. But Facebook itself, I think just the algorithm just kind of kill any videos, but our photos, they're, they're always gonna do well. So there's kind of your tried and true. If you have a nice high quality image or collection of images, those are sometimes, but I wouldn't say shy away from video because if you're, you know, have some cool videos out there, you know, you never know if you can kind of cut through that, but just from our experience. Any other questions? We have about, about 10 more minutes with Matt to continue putting them, putting them on the spot here. Well, I have a, a quick question for you. Um, this might be like asking you to pick your favorite child, but do you have like a favorite post that you guys have put out or that you've put out? Um, I think uh, we put out some posts recently that have done pretty well. So that's always nice to, to see. Like we did the whole, you know, don't push your slower friend down if you see a bear so that was just we didn't provide real bear tips with that but um we're trying to save friendships out there but that that did pretty well um you know we did a whole campaign about you know don't pet the fluffy cows we had some nice graphics with that and that always did well but uh but yeah there's been some great stories out there not just from our account but from a lot of the park accounts you know uh bryce canyon had a, a who do you love during february with their hoodoos out there 
and they had some really nice inspiring kind of love stories about people who met in parks and things like that and um, this year especially we have that overall theme that we're trying to work in of your park story so getting people to really kind of connect with their parks and their programs and I can share that guidance with y'all as well because that's something that we're going to be using throughout the year and um, using the hashtag your park story and I, I think that kind of fits in those are the kind of posts that I think um, we do enjoy seeing those meaningful posts that people connect with and um, I think really kind of appreciate not just the parks, um, but again, all those different kind of stories in there. Okay, we got got another question. Um, in your experience, are infographics a good way to get information about out to people? Um, or is there another medium that's better for announcements and updates? No, I think infographics are a great tool. You know, we use them when we put out, you know, visitation statistics, or we've even done just some like heat safety related ones or some hiking ones. Again, I think that creates that really shareable content that anybody can pick up. And those are things too that the media or even like other accounts, especially if it's kind of evergreen type of content, that then everybody can kind of use and, and learn from. And um, one thing that we still see sometimes in our parks that we kind of frown upon is when people take screenshots of like posters or a press release or any kind of document and they use that as their visual or their image and again that's not really accessible you're going to be hard pressed to have to type all that alt text in uh, and it's basically just hurting your engagement when you're just putting out just a not really attractive visual so I think an infographic is a, another kind of uh, you know, great way to get out your information as long as they're, you know, done, you know, simple and eye catching and, you know, um, really can create that kind of shareable moment. So you mentioned the um, your park story theme. Um, Katie from the uh, Mountain to Sound Greenway asked, do you use themes or any other kind of framework to guide um, what you post when? Um, yeah, just grabbing a link here too. Yeah, we got lots of lots of links to request from you after this, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, just dropped in uh, the Your Park story one. But yeah, really, uh, the last couple of years, especially, we do have uh, monthly themes. So you know, those were set up usually the year prior, and some of them are based on again those national kind of uh, conversations like Women's History Month and Black History Month. Um, great outdoors month in June, things like that. So we build out guidance for that, that then we can share with the parks and the programs. And it's kind of like we encourage, you don't have to do everything, but if you have the capacity, here's some great resources. And we certainly find if we provide guidance and directions, then people are more easily able to play and have the time to kind of be inspired and know what, they're, what they want to kind of participate in. Same thing with National Park Week, you know, each day will have its own theme, we'll have examples, we'll have ways for people to, you know, get involved. So I think anytime you can kind of build out those themes or, or latch onto those kind of, kind of national uh, campaigns and conversations is a great way to, to get noticed. Any last questions for Matt in the last few minutes here? Well, if not, I think we can go ahead and end a couple minutes early. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I am I know I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone else did as well. And we really, really appreciate you coming to join us today. And um, I know I, we're all looking forward to engaging more with the national social accounts moving forward. Yeah, thank you. And again, if anybody has any additional questions or any more links or resources they'd like access to, just let me know. Feel free to, my email's in the chat. So uh, always feel free to reach out. Great, thanks. Oh, and I forgot to say, Matt, um, the walk hiking with tall friends to catch spider webs has been like my favorite post of the past <laughs> few months. So bravo on that one. I've had a lot of hate from all the tall people out there, though. So <laughs> as a short person, I appreciated it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks, guys. And thank you all for joining us. I will see you again soon.